what I'm going to present here is the beginning part of my paper, Mental Photography and the Formation of the Global Brain in China. The full paper will be made available in some fashion or other. So look out for it if you find some, what I'm presenting here interesting. 1897 was a year that largely goes on our radar screen. In hindsight, it turns out to be a year of uncanny six coincidence. Stars were aligned. In that year, Nikola Tesla published on electricity. China had its first native-owned power state in Shanghai. And Tan Zitong, a starry-eyed young reformist, wrote extensively on electricity, ether, and global psychic connectivity. But who was Tan? What does he have anything to do with the Tesla? A photograph here serves as the best way of introducing the subject. The photograph was taken in 1896 at the Light Drawing Tower in Shanghai. The sitters here included some of the most consequential intellectual leaders of the time. Among them, Liang Jicao and Tan Sitong. They form a Buddhist ensemble. They also enact the traditional iconography of the seven sages of the bamboo group and the elegant gathering and so on. The photo is historically sig significant on many levels. Tan Sitong, the half kneeling figure with the palm pressed together was to make waves on the national stage. He was one of the pivotal figures in the Hundred Days Reform, which sought, among other things, turn Imperial China into a constitutional monarchy. The reform effort failed. Tan and other five eminent leaders involved in the reform were executed on a public square in Beijing in 1898. The execution scene was a gruesome political theater. The reformists had planned on assassination of Empress Dowager Cixi, who stood in the way of the reform. Having engineered the crackdown on the reform, the Empress Dowager doubled down on the punishment of her opponents to inflict pain on Pan and his peers. The execution team deliberately selected a blunt knife. It was intended to deal 20 or so blows to chop off their heads. Tan faced his death with astonishing calm. Mistress surround Tan's martyrdom. He could have fled the country as his peers did to Japan, yet he chose to stay and face the music. His calmness in confronting death has fed various speculations. He surely knew the consequences of his position. Public execution in his days were known quantities. A criminal was typically led to Taisuko, a marketplace in Beijing. Executioners used a ghost head knife. Depending on the skill of the executioner, the pain inflicted on the execution could prolong, if not done swiftly. These visceral facts were known to anyone living in Beijing. A practitioner of swordsmanship himself, Tan surely have had an intimate knowledge of visceral experience of cutting and bodily condition. Still, he chose to face execution when he had the choice of escape. It is hard not to attempt some kind of reconstructive modeling of his thought process. We need to model his mind. Two scenarios must have run through his mind. One is the normative gruesome executional scenario that 
the average resident of Beijing runs mentally. The other is Tan's imaginary modeling of the afterlife situation that might mitigate it against the first one. The first layer sketched above is relatively easy to deduce. The second one is more elusive. It needs a bit more archeological work. Tan had clear notions of the afterlife scenario he had all mapped out in the farewell poem he wrote in his prison cell to his wife. Here I'll quote, on the April 3rd of 1897, I shall dress up in preparation for execution. Now I recall Lady Li Run, my wife, whom I married April, uh, on April 3rd, 1883, now a total of 15 years. We shall both be reborn in the world of bliss in the West. Subsequently, we shall live together in the lotus world like the Kalaminka or Chiva Chiva birds." Unquote. The afterlife scenario presumes a disembodied spirit in an out-of-body experience. Quote, life and death are like a dream, unquote, says Tan. Much of this is medieval in disposition and structure. Overlaying this is another scenario, one informed by intimations of modernity. Tan encountered and embraced modern scientific thought and technology in the form of photography, telescope, and microscope. Electricity in particular had an indelible imprint in his worldview. Henry Wood's um, ideal suggestion for mental photography translated into Chinese by John Fryer was the single most important catalytic agent in Tan's life. Henry Wood, a New Englander, had suffered depression and other ailments. As conventional medical treatment failed him, he improved his health through spiritual healing. His experience turned him into an active promoter of the New Thought movement, premised upon the conviction that thoughts are things. His ideal suggestion gained wider um, uh, readership. It exalts the reality of mental life lording over superficial existence. John Fry, a missionary turned translator active in Shanghai, rendered the book into Chinese titled Zhixing Mian Bing Fa in the manner of liberal translation mixed with annotation and interpolation. Just as Tan Sitong felt that he was going nowhere in his voracious reading, he chanced upon Fry's translation of Wood's book. He felt a deep connection. A year later, Tan published his Ren Xue, which resonates with Wood's ideal suggestion. Both presume the material form of thought by way of electricity. To Tan, it is the ether, Yi Tai, which makes it possible for thoughts to travel across the continent, uh, uh, travel across and connect with other human beings. What both try to do is to integrate as much as possible existing school of thought and mix them with the latest experientially based knowledge in the name of science. Both Wood and Tan made rhetorical use of photography as a medium at once material and conceptual. To what the body is the grand composite photograph of previous thinking and mental states. To Tan, photography is the medium that allows him to decenter the individual subjectivity and wrest subjectivity from the body as the anchorage. Tan's meditation on photography passes phot photographic image as an otherness, an object to be contemplated. With the Tan, Photography was more of a photographic event, a process taking place in the mind. Henry Wood captures the dynamic of this photographic event for Tan. The human souls retain ideals as photographic prints. Tan's reflection on photographic image follows the same line of thought. While 
running an internal flow photographic image is nothing new. Modern technology apparatus provides more immediate sensory experience. Electricity left a deep impression on Tan and the late 19th century public. To Tan, electricity is significant in that it is part of the nexus of optics and life-giving energy. It abolished the boundary between the interior and exterior, the visible and the invisible. It is thus the perfect vehicle and a serial material medium of thought that can travel uh, afar unimpeded. This medium makes it possible for personal and national boundaries to dissolve and universal sympathy to be possible. Modern, uh, modern technology made such sympathy all the more palpable. For Kanye Wei, Tan's mentor, for instance, massacre and genocides recorded in history books did not quite touch him. Warfares came down to code numbers. The historic event of the Qing army's massacre of 200,000 Zhao soldiers did not sink in for him. When he saw pictures of bodies strewn across the battlefields in the Franco-Prussian War. However, he could no longer remain calm. He felt visibly what it was like to suffer as a human, thereby empathizing with the fellow human beings across distant space. Now, with this backdrop in mind, we gain some insight into the group photo. It is not just a, yet another iteration of the traditional elegant gathering, nor primarily an index of social gathering of ceremonial occasion. Rather, it is meant to enact a Buddhist scenario, inward look, turning, and gesturing towards a psychic connectivity. To that extent, it's not so much a photograph as it is a met meta photograph, for it points to a mental event that is an invisible and unphotographable. Reflecting on the photograph, Tan and his peers saw the photographic subject as Buddhist statues, and they performed as such. The point, however, is not that the statuesque figures, however photographically or here photographically captured, have material endurance. Rather, the sculptural analogy points to the dynamic of Buddhist statues with, the, with their evocation of inner states. In Henry Wood's formulation of uh, mental photography, the object is a vivid mental image. At the time when the group photograph was taken in 1896, ways of defining the medium of food photography was up for grabs, both globally and in China. Time was aligning the medium with Henry Wood's mental photography. In the meantime, he was also drawing on the reflective medium of portrait painting that had been infected by photographic verisimilitude. The genealogy could be traced back to four centuries. For our purpose, Ren Xiong's self-portrait suffice as a milestone. Its photographic portrait of Ren's head and bo uh, body stand in graphic contrast with the forceful an angular calligraphic linear configuration of his robe and pants. Then there's Xuan Ding's self-portrait that sets his own likeness on the pictorial simulated inkstone, an instance of remediation. It thus stages self-image as an immersion property welling up from the natural texture of rock and caves. Meanwhile, it also plays on the reflective surface of inkstone as a mirror, reflecting the subject looking to the mirror, uh, the inkstone mirror. The heavenly maiden spreads flowers, a penny by Xu Bi Hong, repurposes the photograph of a Peking opera actor who um, placed the heavenly maiden in a play based on the Vimrakoti Sutra. He paints his own eyes into the photographic subject, thereby showcasing intersubjectivity and making good the Buddhist notion of the non-self. Finally, this line of development culminates in Tsu Wen Yun's portrait 
of the painter Wu Changshuo. Like Renxiong's self-portrait, it contrasts the photographic with the painterly models. Spanning seven decades, these four works suggest a photographic paradigm in portraits. While highlighting the preeminence of photo photography in picture and subject likeness, they also gesture towards photographics, uh, photographs, otherness, and its unreliability in conveying the true spirit of the subject. The true spirit often expressed in the matter of qi or energy is better captured by calligraphic traces and dynamic linear patterns, as Ren and Zhu both demonstrate, or the fluttering drapery, as Xu's painting shows. Qi, likewise, informs tense mental photography. In the group photo taken in the Light Drawing Tower Studio in 1896 in Shanghai, Tan appears as a Buddhist monk with the palms pressed, bearing his right shoulder, which is a Buddhist posture. The pose evokes the Diamond Sutra. Quote, at this time, elderly venerable Shubhuti arose amongst the assemblage, bare his right shoulder, genuflected with the right knee on the floor, joined his palms reverently and addressed to the Buddha." Unquote. The evocation of the Diamond Sutra brings up the most recited lines in the Sutra. All the dhammas of implement, uh, implementalities are akin to dreams, fantasies, bubbles, and shadows. They also bear resemblance to Dew drops or electricity, one should contemplate upon all things in this wise. Unquote. It is notable that the set of visual tropes included dian, now rendered here as electricity. In traditional Chinese parlance, dian denotes li <clears throat> excuse me, uh, lightning, as you can see uh, through some of these early examples. When modern electricity entered China in the 19th century, it was commonly translated as dian. Henry Wood renders electricity as thought power carried, carrier of divinity through every vein and tissue. Quote, love invigorates. Its electric thrill sends new life through sluggish minds, weak bodies, and paralyzed limbs. A current of healing love upon the lame man that he at once walked, leaped, unquote. This apparently resonated with the Tan well, just as Henry Woods considers mental photography powered by such divine electricity, Tan likewise conceives photographic medium in similar terms. The two self studio in 19, in 1897, where he took a group photo with his nephew and his tutor, belongs to a studio chain. The studio was the first to provide electric light photo uh, photograph um, for its customs in China. Around the time Tan Zedong posed for the group photo in the light drawing tower, he was finishing his magnum opus, Ren Xue, Composed in 1897, the work is a profound reflection on body, mind, consciousness, and cosmology. It sheds light on why Tan takes phot photography seriously and conceives it in a metaphysical framework. For him, what constitutes a subjective self is not primarily one's body, but the consciousness that encompasses temporally, past and present, and spatially, the entire cosmos. In fact, the individual doesn't own consciousness. Instead, some form of cosmic consciousness passes the individual self. Self, as Tan sees it, a la Buddhist lens, is utterly unlocatable. The connecting medium for him is the qi or energy. While it is a time-ordered concept, it quite more mature form. Tan draws on modern knowledge of electricity, a la Henry Wood, 
and presume the eternal medium of electric uh, energy that permeates the cosmos and carries consciousness. Much of it is an amalgamation of Buddhist cosmology and modern technology. The Buddhist cosmology he draws on is largely derived from the Huayan school based on, on the Tamsaka Sutra or the Flower Garden Sutra, which had a rival in late revival in late 19th century China. The key cosmological tropes there is Indra's net. Tan Tong has his soulmate across the Pacific Ocean. I'll stop here and for the rest of the paper, uh, please look up for its publication or um, its delivery in some other fashion. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>